intend to create more than one million jobs in four years. And um, the first way we're going to do it is to look at the public services. I said before, we're going to do a human resource gap analysis to see what the optimal numbers in the public service should be in all the various sectors. And based on that, be able to fill in, you know, whatever gaps there are. That, that, that's the first part. The second part is we're going to inject money into infrastructural development again because that will involve the construction industry, engineering and so on and so forth. And so it will bring a lot of artisans and everybody back into work. We're looking at what I call the big push, the big infrastructural push. And that's going to be an injection of about $10 billion to dualize our roads, to complete the 200 senior secondary schools, to finish all the hospitals that we were building, you know, to do bridges, you know, in order to open up the country and all that. So there's going to be an injection of $10 billion. And we believe that that should allow the engineering sector and the um, uh, construction sector, you know, the cement sector, you know, building material sector, you know, to create at least, you know, 300 to 400,000 uh, jobs a year. A year. There are funds for afforestation, mainly billions of dollars for afforestation. We're going to come with a new initiative in, in, in forestry, tree growing, and it's going to be in every district of this country. We're going to employ young people to be involved in growing trees and reclaiming some of our lands that are spoiled. And we intend to inject about some 100 to 200 million dollars into that sector. I'm sure that that will create another 100,000 to 200,000 jobs. Uh, going forward. We want to support uh, the Made in Ghana products, including supporting the use of local raw materials. So we are going to focus on more Made in Ghana. We will renew our emphasis on component assembly, not just in automobiles, but also home appliances and light manufacturing in general. We will deepen and expand the 1D1F and we will focus on implementing the integrated bauxite and aluminum industry, as well as the iron and steel industry. The preparatory work for these two industries is now complete. The legal uh, framework is set. And in our next term, inshallah, you will see Ghana realize the vision, the long-held vision of building an integrated bauxite and in aluminum industry, as well as in integrated iron ore and steel industry, which will be based in the northern part of Ghana. I all recall the Great Depression mm. between 1929 uh, and 1930, mm. when uh, uh, FDR, you know, mm. uh, uh, President FDR uh, Roosevelt of, of the United States uh, came into power. He came with a new deal. I think after every great depression, after every great challenge, you need stronger policies, you need something to give people hope when he was promising the new deal a lot of people did not believe in it but if you have social security today across the globe it's because fdr brought it up mm -hmm. and we need to get to that point where after every great challenge every war i mean you need a marshall plan and the people's manifesto mm -hmm. is the marshall plan there for ghana is, is, the act is going to be a regulation that is going to cement that particular policy um, tracking of that particular policy so then if we have an act a regulation whenever the issue of unemployment uh, rises up we have an act or a regulation that backs that particular um, um, that particular term so then we 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 don't have to say that okay now we know that this is your mandate to do it so just go and do it like that we have law that is backing it you understand so as you are doing it you're going to work um, one million jobs over four years mm. no 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 i mean two hundred and fifty thousand jobs a year uh, if you put in place, you know, if you continue with the one district, one factory, for example, mm -hmm. if you have uh, road constructions mm -hmm. across the country, when you are building new universities, for example, when you are empowering people with digital skills for them mm -hmm. to kind of come up with jobs on their own, maybe the next Amazon is from Ghana, maybe the next Facebook is from here. Mm -hmm. And we can only imagine that in a digital world, when you are kind of creating such platforms for mm -hmm. people to get those skills, you make them more relevant. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to also emphasize on the fact that from what I've read and from what I've been hearing so far, the 250,000 jobs are not just going to be like governmental jobs. They, okay. they, are, not, they are not going to be... It can be from private sector. Exact, they are going to stimulate exact, private sector. Good. Exactly. Great. Let me go to... Um, Post-COVID season, when we are looking at how we are going to recover the economy. Uh, we'll be virtually looking at people are being redundant over the years. I mean, that over, over this COVID period, I'm sure that companies have realized that they can actually use less people for... for 
for more jobs. Hence, yes, there's, the, there's going to be that deficit. But then if you are going to read what the People's Manifesto is talking about, I think that it has highlighted about 16 different sectors that are going to create employment. I mean, in from tech let's even take the agriculture, for example. I mean, it has plans of processing 50% uh, of the cocoa made in Ghana. That alone is job creation. Right. You're welcome back. This is News Fire, least your most authoritative news analysis platform. And we are joined by Dr. Prisla Chumesi Bafo, uh, economist and senior lecturer, Department of Economics at the University of Ghana. Thank you very much for uh, being patient with us. Right. Also, Dr. Edward Esiedu is economist and lecturer, Department of Finance, University of Ghana Business School. Hello, Doc. Uh, it's, yes, Dr. Sedu. Good morning. Un unmute your mic. Good morning. Great, great, great. Great to have you. Um, so, as you heard earlier, you heard uh, former President Mahama uh, speak about uh, one million jobs he intends to create. Um, there are people who are very skeptical about that. That is just a vote buying gimmick. You had Vice President um, Baumia on industrialization and job creation by the NPP. They will continue with the one district, one factory, uh, and so on and so forth. And then you had uh, young graduates uh, talk about what they think of the two manifestos. And it's very critical that they actually paid attention to the impact of COVID and then compared that to with all of these lofty you know, promises that the parties are making. The show, as always, is brought to you by Bank of Africa, strongest a group and closest a partner, MTN, everywhere you go. Ashesi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa. Consolidated Bank, Ghana, we stand with you. Duraplus, where Duraplus goes, water flows. We lead, we build home for you. Star Assurance, your solid partner, and Rehoboth Properties. That's where to go if you are looking uh, to deal in real estate. Okay, so um, what are the things that come at you when you look at the questions of uh, jobs uh, in both manifesto? Uh, Dr. Chumensi Bafo. Thank you very much. Good morning once again, mm. and good morning to your cherished viewers and listeners. Right. Um, great. In trying to situate the discussion of the manifestos of the two major parties um, in the country, I want us to have uh, the context of job creation or the employment, um, overall employment environment in the country. Right. So clearly, when you look at the growth path of um, Ghana, we have done considerably well when you look at um, the last two decades with some checkered drops here and there um, due to challenges we face on the international um, um, world market. So here I, I have a chart here which is trying to uh, look at the pattern of GDP growth and then employment to population ratio. And when you look at it, you see that there is a clear disconnect between our GDP growth and employment, um, which is a major challenge. Mm. And then it also shows when you calculate the elasticity, that is how responsive jobs are to the growth of the country, it is very low. We're doing a, an average of about 0 0.5, mm. which means that our employment is not very sensitive to mm. the growth. And that explains why most of the times when we see the growth numbers, people are quite skeptical okay. because they feel that there are no um, productive jobs. So in looking at the growth, where is the growth coming from? When you look at the pattern, you see that clearly um, with structural transformation that is occurring in, in the country, we expect that um, the growth will be driven mainly by the industrial sector. But when you look at the data, you see that growth is now being driven by the service sector. So agriculture is declining and service has taken over. And as a country, we have missed the very relevant middle, which is the industrial sector, which is supposed to be the driver of the growth 
which is what a lot of other developed countries have gone through, like you look at Asia and all those countries. The reason we focus so much on industrialization is that that is where massive jobs are created. When you look at the pattern of employment, you also see that most of the employment is created in the service sector. But the challenge with the service sector is that most of the jobs are informal sector jobs, meaning that we don't tend to find a lot of productive jobs in the service sector. Mm. In 2018, for example, we see that... Our economy um, is largely service-driven, Exactly, right? largely service-driven. The reason we should pay more attention to industrialization. Exactly. We need to pay more attention to industrialization because... The service sector is not a labor-intensive sector. Mm. And we are dealing with a situation where we have masses who, are, who need jobs mm -hmm. for, um, uh, to, for a good livelihood. Mm. So in 2018, for example, we see that services contributed about 48% to total employment. Agriculture, 33%. And industry is 18.6%. So it clearly shows the challenge we have with employment in the country. Mm. And here, when we talk about employment, I think we need to also focus on the type of employment we are talking about. Employment mainly, we focus on productive wage salaried employment, because those are the kinds of employment that are able to lift people out of poverty mm. and improve their livelihoods. So in Ghana, the job creation challenge really it's not about people lacking jobs, but it is what kinds of jobs are they doing? Mm. And when you look at the statistics, so for example, when you look at unemployment numbers, you see that in 2017, our unemployment rate is 5.1. It is highest for the youth, which is 7.1%. Mm -hmm. But when you compare it to other African countries, we are not doing badly on the unemployment level. Okay. Why? Because a lot of people are working, but the issue is, what types of work are they doing? And when you look at the data, you see that um, most of the people who are involved in employment in the country are doing vulnerable jobs. And what do I mean by vulnerable jobs? Vulnerable jobs, according to International Labour Organization, are jobs that do not give enough coverage to the people. This includes own account workers, like one-man business. Mm those people are in the vulnerable category. And then we're looking at contributing family workers, people who work in household enterprises. Mm -hmm. Those groups are in vulnerable category. And in Ghana, when you look at the statistics, 66% of all employed persons are in vulnerable jobs. Mm. That That's is self-employment. Self-employment. And contributing family workers. What percentage? 66 percent. 66 percent. Exactly. And that's vulnerable. Yeah. That is vulnerable. Oh, but Me I thought that that was a place of wealth. No. Uh, greater satisfaction that you exactly. are doing your own job. Exactly. So in the informal sector, we need to also be careful not to box everybody in there. Mm. There are two groups. You have the entrepreneurial groups which are the group that are creating jobs. Okay. They have workers under them. Right. That group is not vulnerable. Okay. But we are talking about the one-man businesses, mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. who own their own businesses. If right. they don't show up, they don't earn income. All right. They do not have any safety net. Mm -hmm. They don't contribute to pension. When they are sick, that is it. Mm -hmm. They don't have any uh, protection. And earnings are right. generally very low for mm -hmm. that group. So in essence, when you pick three Two out of three people in Ghana are in vulnerable employment. Yes, and this, this is the group that the stimulus that the president you know, announced for uh, the COVID are not covered because you cannot show, because you are doing just a one-man business in your corner, you are not properly registered, you don't contribute to tax, you don't do anything, so you are not covered. So you can imagine that in COVID, this would have suffered you know, exactly. the biggest. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. And that explains the dire situation we face. And right. we had to lift the lockdown because mm -hmm. people had to go out and make a living. That's right. Really. Mm. So in this context, we see that something needs to be done about the very important missing middle in the country, which mm. is the industrialization agenda. Mm -hmm. Because decent jobs are mainly created there. Right. So within that group, 
We also look at wage employment. So overall, in 2017, wage employment accounted for 28% of total employment in the country. And this includes public and private sector workers. Right. The public sector offers a lot of job security than the private sector. But there are obviously higher earnings and remunerations in the private sector. So we expect any job creation agenda of a political party to be critically focusing on productive enterprises in the country mm -hmm. so that they first of all they start they grow and then they generate sustainable jobs right right mm -hmm. that is where i would want to situate the discussion to Great. say that any attempt at creating job mm -hmm. we need to look at it is not just a matter of creating jobs. First mm -hmm. of all, what kinds of jobs are being created? That's right. Right. And what and then, kinds of jobs are actually needed? Exactly. Mm. Exactly. To lift people out of poverty uh, and all that. Right. So um, in all this, when you compare the two political parties, you mm. see that they all acknowledge in their manifesto that job creation is a multi-sectoral approach. That's right. You need to be very intentional about any attempt that you make at all levels to be able to create jobs. Mm. So basically, um, that is my, my, my take on the position of most of the issues that have been raised in terms of job creation in the two manifestos. Right. And uh, I think also that if you're reading the manifesto and you're looking to see a, a sector on jobs only, then you may be making a mistake. Because almost every sector, they talk about things that you find jobs popping up. Uh, however, the NDC dedicates a portion to job creation and talks about job creation target. It talks about creating sustainable and decent job. And they say that is the Ejumapa. And you heard uh, former President Mahama mention the one million jobs that they intend to create among others. So we'll get to some bits of the uh, portions of things they intend to do. Uh, if you take a trade, areas of trade, uh, the economy in itself, the things they want to do, you are looking really at job creation. So let's uh, have, um, let's, let's, Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at a few things here. And okay, so let's, let's have uh, Dr. Edward Siedu also uh, introduce us to your perspective, looking at the two manifestos and the question of jobs. Who is providing us a superior pathway? Yeah, thank you so much, Samson, uh, and, and the listeners for, for joining today. I'm very happy uh, Priscilla started the presentation not going straight into comparing NDC and MPP. Uh, so I'm very happy setting the tone. Uh, what is the situation that we face today, uh, irrespective of who is in power, what is the situation that we face today? And then we, later on we can go into it. I, I'm a bit uh, not so comfortable just saying NDC's manifesto is better than MPP's manifesto or the reverse. Okay. I think the, the key discussion that we should be having is about the gaps in the society. So the key aspect here is what is the desired level of employment? Also, what is the unemployment rate mm. uh, that we all desire? What is the aspirations of the of Ghanaians? Okay, so uh, uh, Priscilla mentioned the, the unemployment rate typically have been around 5%. But if we talk to the average person on, on the street, uh, everybody's saying we don't have jobs, okay? <laughs> or we don't have good jobs. Yeah. So if you use that number alone mm. to say that I'm doing well and I'm not doing well, we are all missing the point. Mm. Okay? And then you go into the second step, which is the, the connection or the relationship between uh, your, the GDP and that unemployment number, uh, rate that you have, which is the five point something. Even if we, we stick to that five point uh, something percent, uh, then the question is, if you grow by 1% in terms of GDP, what is its effect? on unemployment, on this conservative <laughs> this big number. Yeah. What is the relation? Yeah. And, uh, and you can see that it may be, we need a huge growth rate to have some uh, significant impact on unemployment. So for me, it's not just going in to say MPP and NDC. As a society, 
what unemployment rate do you think that we should aim for? So what are the, the gaps that we should aim for? That when we get there, we will know that the average person is doing well. And uh, if you go in and just say that, oh, the unemployment rate is 5% across board, there, there, there are a lot of disaggregation. So the unemployment rate for men, the unemployment rate for women, for the educator, somebody with a secondary school education, somebody with a primary school education, the story is bigger than just putting up the numbers in mm -hmm. terms of I'm going to create $1 million, one million jobs, I'm going to create $2 million, or I have created $2 million. So we shouldn't play that game as a, as a country, mm. uh, just doing the pitching. For all the intervention, I'm not just saying it for the labor market, but even for the infrastructure. What is the gap? How many, how many roads do we need to build in Accra? What is the gap? And then say that, okay, as party A, how many roads can you realistically build within your period? How? And then you can tell us the financing model for these roads. So we, it's the same thing that we have to, we have to, so for me, that is, that is, that is my position. I know the, the, there was a lot of talk about building roads and it's leading to employment, uh, the type of roads and all that. And if you go to the Ministry of Finance right now, I'm sure they have done pre-feasibility on a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. and, and they are all in the pipeline. So what stops political parties from going, if we are looking at the outcomes of the average Ghanaian, going there and looking at the pipeline project that pre-feasibility have been done to see, because you obviously talk about the financial uh, returns of this project and also the labor market effects of this project. Mm -hmm. For us to be, make those discussions, if you build a road from Accra to Kumase, how many people are going to be employed? What type of jobs? You cannot just say, I'm creating one million, one million jobs, right? So let's set the targets for ourselves as a country mm. on all these indicators. And then let's go back into the manifestos and begin to think whether what they are proposing, we can actually achieve those targets. And they're not pitching the two together. Because at the end of the day, uh, NDC may have very important or very good policies. NPP may have very good policies. Whoever wins the election, we need to bring the, all the good policies together. Mm -hmm. because we, it's not like getting one and forgoing the other. Right. You, you know, so... So uh, listening to the discussion on health is the same issues. Mm -hmm. What is good in the MPP manifesto? What is good in the NDC manifesto? Can we combine these things All right. so that the average Ghanaian mm. will be better off? All right. Okay, so uh, and, uh, that is unfortunately, my, my take on it. Unfortunately, we can't have your ideal situation of combining <laughs> the two. <laughs> so, so I'm going to return to you. <laughs> right. So I'm going to return to you, Dr. Sedu, so that you, you look at at least some of the pillars of, of the, of the, in the manifestos that undergird the path that you feel we should be, we should be yeah. charting by way of uh, uh, job creation. The NDC starts by an introduction. And I must say that I'm getting a lot of comments already after uh, Priscilla's introduction, and after also hearing from you about this being how we should be doing this discussion. Thank you all so very much. Now, the NDC begins by saying the biggest challenges facing any government is the ability to create enough jobs that pay well enough to avoid the problem of, quote, working poor, unquote where workers' wages are so low that they cannot meet the basic necessities of life and remain poor even though they are working. A Jumapa will not only ensure the creation of enough employment opportunities for our youth, but will also ensure that workers are paid decent wages. We will also ensure the provision of legal and social protection, such as due process in resolving labor disputes sick and annual leave, as well as a safe and healthy working environment. This will not only create a healthy and productive labor force, but it will also be in line with the conventions of the International Labor Organization to which Ghana is a signatory. How nice. Then they begin by saying they are going to create a minimum of 250,000 jobs per year 
under the Ejumapa program over the next four years. This is how the NPP introduces um, the questioning of jobs. And I'm looking at it because you can't find a particular portion where yeah. they are just dedicated to job because in trade particularly they are talking about industrialization when you are talking about how they are bringing in uh, this uh, car manufacturing plant you know all the uh, one district one job uh, or factory all of these things that is job creation the NAVCO pro programs how they intend to expand and increase the and the youth employment and all of those things so I take from a portion of their manifesto where they say building the private sector for accelerated growth what is the growth they are talking about jobs right so they say at the heart of the president's vision for a ghana beyond aid it's a prosperous and self-confident ghana that is in charge of her economic destiny being in charge of our economic future requires a vibrant and successful private sector aligned with the this vision this like president kufour saying the private sector is the engine of growth it also requires us as a government to maintain macroeconomic stability remove the constraints and bottlenecks in the way of the private sector incentivize the sector and create the enablers for achieving our collective national vision in line with this and building on from what we have done, we have achieved over the last three years, three and a half years, we plan over the next four years to set out a clear cluster of core economic sectors to guide private sector investment, tackle the long-standing key binding constraints to private sector growth, promote enablers for private sector growth, invest in the development of an, an entrepreneurial culture, and build a resilient financial services sector for economic transformation. And then they proceed to explain all of that to you. Now, when you read how they both introduce the questions of, you know, jobs, if you go to the uh, trade sector, how they give an introduction, even the agri sector, you find that both of them have some ideals that we all can, you know, appreciate and be happy about. Right. But, but the questions you guys started asking this morning has been, how are we going to fund this? Now, first, are there any specific job issues that you isolate in both uh, manifestos? And how uh, do they look like from where you sit? Samson, thank you. But let, let me quickly state this before I proceed to your main. I think one thing that is obviously missing from the two manifestos is a clear distinction between a job and employment. Okay. You see, if we are not lucky, they will throw dust into our eyes with, say, creating jobs, creating jobs. But as far as labor practice is concerned, a job is different from employment. In some breads, you can use the words interchangeably. When we are talking about employment, we are looking at jobs or working conditions that are sustainable, usually beyond six months, with clear-cut employment you know, conditions of work that, to a large extent, you are quite sure of some certainty about your work, at least short to medium term. Of course, these things are subject to your own conduct and, you know, a few other things. These are also jobs that ultimately will earn you a pension, may earn you other conditions like health care, what have you, even beyond the time of retirement. So these are more like permanent engagements. Of course, you can change, you know, work in the course of your working life. But there's some certainty, there's some continuity, and there's what the ILO describes as decent work. So we need to distinguish that. And you realize that when Prisla gave her intro, she mentioned the fact that only 28% of us are in what we can describe as the wage employment, while 66 are in the 
vulnerable you know kind of employment mm. those in the wage employment that small number usually they constitute the ones that have some certainty some guarantee some decent work you know bits that we talk about so i think that the political parties should have been fair to us by clearly distinguishing between the two because in some situations they will tell you that oh there was some registration exercise like it is happening now voter uh the EC is doing some verification exercises or something where you have to go and check whether your name is in the book. Like they may right. have employed somebody for mm. a week or three weeks, and then that ends. But they will count it as creating some jobs for you. Sometimes some of these jobs, you can count them either as double, multiple, or whatever terms you want to use. Because somebody will benefit from a first package, still benefit from another package after six months, because they are all moving around the place. Some people may even have permanent jobs, but they may take advantage of some of these things. But you end up putting all of it as if you have created jobs. So clearly, we need to bring that distinction. Mm. The focus of the country, as far as the unemployment fight is concerned, is we should aim at getting people into what has been described as proper em employment, not the casual kind of activity mm. that you can describe as jobs, but it doesn't come with any job security or related benefits like pension and what have you. Now, if you look at the way the two parties have gone about their manifestos, yes, there are clear differences. NDC tries to summarize it or tries to put specific things out there. But like you said, for MPP in particular, you need to go through sector by sector. But a few things stand out. You can see that the focus includes industrialization, agri and agro-based you know, activities, mining, some bits related to infrastructure development. So construction and all that will generate some jobs. A bit about services and a bit about things like, uh, let's say, the creative arts, you know, stuff like that. Tourism, you get a bit of mention here and there. But I think that industrialization, like Priscilla said, is very key. And if you look at the MPP manifesto, I think there seems to be a lot more in industrialization. Mm. I'm also excited about the fact that there seem to be some interlinkages between mining and industry. So we are looking at extracting our bauxite and iron ore, and then moving on to entities that will turn these you know, raw materials into secondary materials for either export or as final or finished product, you know, stuff like that. Mm. And I think that those interlinkages are very, very important. NDC also does something like that. If you look at the NDC, they are a big push, the 10 million one, the 10 billion one. It seems to be their flagship. But the focus seems to be more of construction or infrastructure development. Mm. That does not mean that they don't also talk about things like agri and what have you. The second thing I observed is that both parties seem to focus on agri, which is good. Because by and large, we, we are still an agrarian you know, kind of country. A, a chunk of our people are still into agri. And the, the interlinkages, i.e. trying to convert farm produce into you know, secondary goods, finished products, semi-finished, adding value, all of it, I think it is very, very important. And uh, if you look at the way they have structured it, for NDC, they also seem to be looking at things related to support for the private sector, which MPP also does. Mm. MB, NDC seem to have categorized certain things that they will do, business support and what have you. But like you said, they don't tell us where the funds are going to come from. Sometimes you can see that they are talking about supporting startups and existing companies and what have you. I'm not too sure if the state itself will find money to do that or the state is going to go in and take you know, equity stakes, partnerships, what have you. But clearly there is something in there. And they're also trying to develop the basis for employment, i.e. skill generation. And I think that I'll give credit to NDC. They try to put a lot about skill, you know, generation and what have you. Because you cannot also employ people who don't have skills. You, you need people with competences to be employed to do various things. So as we try to create the jobs, 
it is good that we do the setup. Mm. The NDC talks about minimum 250,000 jobs per year. Uh, I wouldn't say it is not doable because the MPP tells us that within the four year period, they've done over 2 million. So if you average it, we can just say roughly 500 billion. But the issue is what is the quality of the jobs that they are going to create? And I think that a lot more work needs to be done. They also need to uh, get us to appreciate how they are going to do some of these things. Mm. The MPP one seems a bit more clear because of the way they structured this. Some of the NDC ones are just bullet points and what have you. But clearly, you can all see, we can all see that they also have a concept. There seems mm. to be a focus on the youth. And I agree, generally. But we also have another category of people who are also vulnerable. And we think that, or I think that we should also find ways of accommodating them in these manifestos. You see, they talk about between uh, the ages of 15 and 35 years, or 40 for the youth. Okay, but those who are 40 to 50 years, some of them are so vulnerable in the sense that these are people who have families, but they don't have skills. So as we consider labor intensive jobs like the construction and what have you, we should also find a way of helping those who are just above or outside the youth bracket, not mm. the very aged, but like they are the, the middle aged people. Mm. Some have lost their jobs, some haven't had the opportunity to be employed, some are into self, you know, uh, generated businesses and mm. what have you. But All right. it is truly part okay. of the vulnerable. So, so now let me, come, let me come to uh, get some views on specific aspects of both manifestos from our experts in the studio right now. And I'd like to state that this show is brought to you by the kindest sponsorship of Bank of Africa, strongest a group and closest a partner, MTN Everywhere You Go, Ashesi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa, Consolidated Bank Ghana, we stand with you. Duraplus, where Duraplus goes, water flows, we lead, we build you, we build home for you. And Star Assurance, your solid partner. Rehoboth Properties, they are also uh, proud uh, to pay the bills for the show. So I'm um, taking a quick break. When we return, We'll hear Dr. Presla Chumesi Bafo and also Dr. Edward Siedu on some specifics of these manifestos and how those align with the, the, the brilliant points that they make in their introductory uh, remarks. And for most of the comments that are coming in right after um, uh, Presler spoke. I'll summarize them with what uh, Kukubako had to say. He said, fantastic introduction premise articulated by the lady at job creation. Impressive, great mind, um, great mind, informative and educative. But how come this is the first time we are hearing about this lady on news file? Incredibly intelligent. So that's a summary of the messages we have had after the first presentation uh, from Presla and also from Dr. Esiedu uh, was made. We'll take a quick break and return to look at some specifics.